So then with that <clears throat> bodhicitta motivation, we can do the verse of refuge in bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the merits of giving and the other perfections. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the merits of giving and the other perfections. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Good to see everybody. So we're continuing our study of mind and mental factors. Actually, I want to just maybe say something brief by way of introduction for today, which is just because I was just thinking about it. But, um, you know, so we're studying like the mind, right? And, and the, you know, our different mental, now we're up to the set. We studied the section on um, virtuous mental factors, and now we're studying the six root mental afflictions. Um, and I, yeah, I was thinking about, well, I was thinking a few things, but I'll just say a couple. One is, um, you know, something in Tibetan, when they say there isn't really a term that that's commonly used that would, you know, like, uh, in other words, Buddhism, right, or Buddhist is an English word, isn't it? Like, um, obviously. Uh, but the Tibetan word they that they use when they talk about that would be nangba, which means, like, inside. And so I, I was thinking, I just was reflecting on this because sometimes I think, um, well, actually some Western, and actually even the word Western, I don't like that word actually, it just struck me. It's a stupid word actually. It implies, actually, I think it's a stupid term. It implies like, actually, it's, it, I think that term implies that you're European, that you're a kind of European colonial person who is looking to the East and it's gonna, whatever. Um, it's kind of, actually, if you're in California, China's to your West, it's a really stupid idea. If you're Australian, you're the same idiotic term right australians are westerners it's just stupid um you know but actually i, th I think it's actually i think we use it because we're uncomfortable saying what like white people of european descent or something i don't know what anyway i'm not sure what, why we use that term it's a stupid term but um i was anyway what i was reflecting on is sometimes um i guess i'll say it that way <laughs> sometimes white men will say uh that in the, the tibetan term for the Tibetan term that is translated Buddhist, which is Nangba, it, it, it actually means inside person. And sometimes like uh, people will say that means like inside group and outside group, but that's not what it means, that's wrong. What it means is, is what we're studying actually. That, and there is from a Buddhist perspective, an inside person means somebody who works on their inside, right? That's what Tibetan lamas will say. There is that, and there is that the idea if you're Buddhist is you work on your own mind. Right, so it's not. I just, I, I, I find that kind of offensive to think like that, that. That the word nangba, somebody wouldn't translate it as like we're the insiders and you're the outsiders. That contradicts the essence of what Buddhism is saying, doesn't it? So, and there is really what if you're Buddhist, the idea, or if you're an inside person, it means you're supposed to work on your own mind, right? Like on what's going on in your mind, and that's what we're studying in this text, isn't it? Is like, um, you know, in the next section is going to be on anger the next next uh, mental state, right? So it's actually identifying what's going on in my mind and working with that. And I just, I, I was I was reflecting on it, I suppose, because I actually probably, uh, probably part of the reason I was reflecting on it is I was actually, I was reading a, recently I was reading a history of um, monotheistic religions. Um, and again, I was pausing. Sometimes people will say, sometimes people will say some of those religions are Western, which is really stupid because they originated in the Middle East, right? Um, so anyway, again, that's just that, that, that's bothering me lately. But um, Western religion, uh, or, I'm sorry, monotheistic religions, right? And, and there's an emphasis in those on the outside. I was just like reading it. And I was going, oh, there's so much like we own this land, or this land is sacred, and this land's not sacred, and and there is an emphasis on our group, right? And then it's okay to kill another group. Um, or they're less important, you know. Um, and what Buddhism is saying, actually, I mean, anybody who would say that of Buddhism is totally doesn't understand Buddhism, right? 
because uh, the very essence of Buddhism is you work on your own mind, right? And if you have if you have anger or hatred towards an insect, that's a mental affliction and is the cause of suffering, right? Uh, so that would apply to human beings and to animals and to not all such beings. And so um, that's what we're studying actually, right? Is how do you work with your own mind, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, so regardless of um, anyway. Uh, for all, you know, for every being, right? Actually, great compassion includes every single sentient being, right? Including the smallest insect. Um, so anyway, that, I was just sort of reflecting on that's what we're studying, actually, is how do you be in, uh, that's actually what I was reflecting on. Was, oh, this teaching is on how do you practice the inside, right? In your own mind. What? How do you identify what's going on in your mind and work with it? And one more point I'll say is the other thing I was reflecting on in, in relation to that was, so we're studying the mental afflictions, right? The six root, and then we'll get to the 20 secondary mental afflictions. The other thing I was reflecting on is, I mean, we're studying these in a certain context of Buddhism, right? And what Buddhism says, I just want to remind us of this, is that these mental afflictions are the cause of suffering, right? And that if that they can be eliminated, right? Like, so that it, when you say, uh, you know, the third noble truth, right? The, the truth of cessation means these are the, you know, the second noble truth, these are the cause of suffering. And the third noble truth is saying, and these can be eliminated. And I just want to like reflect on that, right? Because actually, um, you know, that's an emphasis in Buddhism, and we and I think we have to when we study these, we're identifying them for a reason, right? That they can be first of all decreased, you know, through applying antidotes or practicing Dharma, and then if you you know through the direct realization of emptiness and uh, meditation on that, these states can be permanently eliminated from our being, which is what liberation is actually right liberation is an inner state right of liberation i mean uh, of having permanently eliminated these mental afflictions you know so that when they say like a foe destroyer right arhat it means that the person's destroyed these right these mental afflictions have been destroyed that's what it means to be an arhat right so when they say the arhats or the buddha right they call him the buddha is the great arhat right um or all his you know those disciples of his who are arhats you know, the, Arhat is translated, it, you know, you'd say it's, it means destroyed the enemy or destroyed the foe. So what's the foe in Buddhism? It's these, you know, and so in one sense, why are we studying these, right? It's like you have to know what you're trying to eliminate. So you can identify it in your mind and then first decrease it and then eliminate it. And it says in this text at some point, uh, you know, as Shantideva says, right, and uh, Lama Tsongkhapa says the same thing, you know, Outer enemies, you know, if you actually it says that Shanti Deva points this out. Outer enemies, even if you um, temporarily defeat them, they'll regroup and they'll come back. Right? Actually, it's true. Even when, like when people try to do genocide, right, it doesn't work. Like um, you can't eliminate all your outer enemies, uh, but your inner enemies you can eliminate. Um, so the idea is that in Buddhism is that you know your inner enemy, right? That's why I was saying this idea of nangba, inner being, right? That you know your inner enemies and your inner friends. Your inner friends are the um, virtuous states of mind, right? Like, uh, it's interesting, right? They say uh, non-hatred, which means love and, uh, and so on, compa and compassion. So we cultivate uh, our inner friends, which are the virtuous mental factors. We eliminate, we first decrease and then eliminate the mental afflictions and that's dharma practice actually right that's and that's the path to liberation and if you achieve liberation it means you've eliminated these mental afflictions right uh, so that's actually what that's what the definition of what's it called so there's a moksha right or liberation uh, and, and, uh, and enlightenment but has eliminated them as well right um okay so anyway it's like a kind of <laughs> little introduction but uh, we're, for those who are following along the text, we're at the bottom of page 53, that's where we left off with anger uh, as one of the um, the second of the mental of the root mental afflictions. Um, and uh, art, you know, this author, this translator translates uh, as, as anger, art translates as hatred. So you can choose which term you prefer for this mental, uh, mental affliction. And you'll see he's starting right with the, um, those, well, anyway, uh, previous, we just studied attachment or desire, and now we're doing anger. So he says, um, regarding anger, the Abhidharma, right, the compendium of knowledge says, what is anger?
sorry. So then he says, um, what is anger? And then the response, it is a malice towards sentient beings, suffering, and phenomena that are sources of suffering. It has the function of agony as a support for not abiding in contact and for misconduct. Um, I'll continue just this next section, paragraph, and we'll uh, reflect on it. So it says, just as has been said above, anger is a malice that upon observing the three objects of observation of anger cannot tolerate them and wishes to harm them. Three ob objects of observation of anger are sentient beings, one's own sufferings, and the sources from which these sufferings arise. Um, so first of all, so, okay, so first of all, what does this mean, a mal malice? So malice means, um, Mr. Rabton addresses that, so, so I'll, I was going to say that one, but I'll, I'll actually say there are two different terms here, but well, are there, two, uh, there are explanations of that word, is malice. So malice is intending to cause harm. And then uh, Geshe Rabton says, anger disturbs and roughens the mind. It acts as a basis for tormenting both self and others and for increasing suffering and its causes. Right? So malice is the wish to harm, right? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and um, yeah, I wish, I wish to do harm, uh, a kind of an animosity, you could say. So, so we go back. So anger is the kind of kind of yeah, go down go into detail. So what is first of all, anger is an agitated state of mind, right? Um, that exaggerates the uh, the negative qualities of its object of observation. I think that's the term he's using here, right? Yeah, object of observation uh and wishes to harm it um and the object of observation as he says here of anger usually we think of it which is the most common version is of other sentient beings right so there is so somebody uh does something you don't like or they caught and actually i want to go through like step by step for a second this because i think it's actually sometimes people get confused about what anger is and uh, you know, Shanti Deva points out, anger arises from unhappiness. Um, yeah, art, actually, art had a translation of that, uh, of something like that. Um, oh, here it is. I'll just read something art translated from uh, um, Arya Deva. I'm not, not Arya Deva. Uh, Vasubandhu, sorry. He translated this. A person who's feel he says, uh, he's talking about anger, and he says, a person who's feeling animosity and malice will necessarily have a tormented mind, subjecting himself or herself to mental distress. Then the body will also become distressed. Um, and then, uh, oh, here's the other part of that. He's, he translates a hatred. So hatred is an animosity, that's his translation for malice, towards sentient beings. Animosity is a harshness of mind towards sentient beings that, if you are overcome by it, will cause you to consider engaging in wrongful conduct such as killing or binding or harming sentient beings. Contentment is happiness. Contentment does not lead to anger, right? So anger comes from discontent. And then he says, he translates it, hatred. So he says, hatred supports, hatred comes from a discontented, discontented state of mind. And it supports remaining in a discontented state and it also supports engaging in misdeeds uh, towards, uh, towards oneself and others. So I just want to point out the process here, right? So what happens is uh, due to our own previous karma, this is the idea of how Buddhism is just going into detail here. Due to our own previous karma, we have an unpleasant experience. Right? Um, not recognizing that that unpleasant moment came about, and it's a moment, right? Any given moment, we have an unpleasant experience. So not recognizing that that unpleasant moment of experience came from our own previous karma, we blame it, essentially, on someone or something else, right? Uh, so we're agitated and we're discontented, we're upset in some way, whether in physical pain or mental suffering. We then blame the arisal of that suffering on someone or something else and then we develop anger or hatred right a kind of malice wanting to harm that object as if that object were the source of our suffering and is by its very nature a source of suffering right um and so do you see that's how the, that's a distortion in anger 
um, there's a distortion there of viewing the object of the anger, the object of observation of the anger, I guess you'd say, as from its as as a bad as a source of suffering, and then wanting to harm it. Um, and then uh, the text here is pointing out, right? So there are three objects of observation. So one is sentient beings, right? Um, you know, and so that's obvious, right? We become angry at another person, and um, and Geshe Rabin points this out. So then, when when you're angry at another person, you see them uh, in an entirely negative light, um, and you, uh, yeah, wish to harm them. Uh, Art's point is an interesting one, right? I mean, or I guess it's Ashley Vasubandhu's point um, that. Uh, so first, there's this moment of he translates it as discontent, some kind of unhappiness, right? Then, when we become angry, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Like the anger itself keeps us in discontent, keeps us unhappy. Our mind stays agitated. But as we're holding on to the anger and staying in the state of discontent, we're blaming, in this case, the first example, the other person for our unhappiness. So first of all, it's kind of weird, isn't it? The first moment of suffering came about due to our previous karma, but we blame it on the other person. Then we keep ourselves through rumination, for example, through kind of staying in an angry state. We keep ourselves in an unhappy state and we continue to blame the other person, or yeah, in this case, other sentient being for that. Um, and eventually, right, and so actually, by its very nature, there's a number of points here. One is by its very nature, therefore, anger is a, is a state that immediately causes unhappiness, right? And as long as we're in anger, we're discontented, we're agitated. I'm going to say more about that in the text here. Um, but that's the very nature of anger. And then anger, by its very nature, is cause. It, sorry, we'll get into this, but it, uh, is while we're in it, it's making us unhappy. It's also destroying our previous good karma, and we're creating negative karma while we're in it. And then, as it says, it serves as a basis for engaging in misdeeds, right? So if you stay in anger enough, uh, or sometimes it can happen in the first instant, but sometimes it takes a while, but um, anger leads us to do negative other kinds of negative actions of body and speech also, right? So anger in and of itself is a mental affliction of the mind. Right, and then if we, uh, if you habituate to anger, eventually you'll do verbal and physical behaviors as well that come from anger and therefore are causes of karmic karmic causes of suffering. Um, so you can see then, I just am pointing out, like if you think about what is anger, right? It's describing it here. Uh, anger in every from every angle is a source of misery. Right, in the moment it is, uh, in the long run it is, in terms of karma. In the short run, it is in terms of what it does to your mind. Also, you know, if you habituate to anger, it becomes easier and easier to give rise to anger. So uh, it causes suffering in that way also, right? But then, and you, we know this, right? Like if you're, um, if you let your mind become habituated to any mental state, actually, it becomes easy to give rise to that mental state. And so, I, actually, we've all met people like this, right? Where we've all maybe been people like this. Um, where if you let your mind get habituated to anger, then anything can make you angry, right? Like where even the tiniest thing can make somebody enraged, you know? Um, and that's the horror of anger, right? It destroys relationships. It leads to all kinds of incredible suffering. Um, and we'll get into that more, but let's continue with the text. So the main object of anger, like was first, are other sentient beings. But then also people can become angry at their own suffering, right? Um, it says here, it cannot tolerate them, right? So that's another. So one is, you know, when you're angry at another person, oh, and it says, and not, not wanting to abide in contact and from his conduct, by the way. The not wanting to abide in conduct, there were two different commentaries to that in the definition of anger. One is like wanting to get away from that person or wanting them to get away from you. Um, or the other is uh, mentally distancing from the object. And the author, the translator, I mean, the, not the translator, the author or the commentator on that said, said a point. He said, Sometimes when we're angry at somebody, we want them to like get lost, right? You may scream at them, go away or something, right? When, when somebody's angry. But then he points out, he says, this one commentator said, sometimes we want to be closer to them, like to go punch them or something. So it's not always that you want to, um, or you, you know, sometimes when people are really angry, they chase after the other person screaming at them, right? The other person says, oh, I'm going to get away from you. And then you chase after them like, shouting or something. So it's not always, it's not always wanting to be apart from them physically, right? Uh, but there's a kind of mental distancing we do, right? Uh, and and I think actually that's an important point here because when you're angry at somebody, there's a sense in which you um, 
mentally distanced from them, which I guess you could translate as like, if they're a human being, dehumanizing them, right? Or like not caring how they feel, not, not um, empathizing with them, right? So when you're angry, where it says you're not wanting to abide in contact, sometimes, I think actually it's a good point. <laughs> if you're an if you're an outside focus, then you might say, oh, you want to distance from them. But this Buddhism is getting at the inside, right? So from an inner perspective, what's getting at is that your mind doesn't empathize. With you. There's a kind of distancing you do. And that's how in anger, you don't care if you hurt the person, right? In other words, if we're, actually, if we're, if we're um, realistic and calm, then we can empathize with others, right? And actually, if you're empathizing with somebody, then by very, actually, it's very hard to want them to suffer, isn't it? Um, you don't want them to suffer because you feel they're suffering. But so I think where it says here, not abiding in contact, it's a mental distancing from the other, where you kind of don't, what's the word? You don't care actually how they feel, you know, and you don't empathize with them. And that's how you can then harm them or even kill somebody. In anger, right? Um, so I, I just want to explain that. So, um, and also it says uh, you can't tolerate. So you can't, you know, so if you're angry at another person, you can't tolerate them, right? Um, their reality, actually, which is actually horrifying in and of itself in one way, right? I mean, if you go back to, I'm not saying somebody, if I, if I look back to my own moment of anger, right, that you can't tolerate another person, but that person is a person, right? Um, they're a real sentient being, so uh, that's the problem. But then with one's own suffering, you can't tolerate that, right? And um, and actually, one way of saying anger, at, I, I sometimes think this, the second one category here, anger at one's own suffering, uh, is the lack of resilience, isn't it? Like, in other words, uh, resilience is a capacity for tolerating what arises, you know, uh, and for learning even from what arises and from sort of saying, you know, how do I use what arises in a meaningful way in my life? Because the truth is, um, sufferings will come along if you're unenlightened. You know, uh, if we're not enlightened already, we're going to meet with suffering, right? We're going to meet with difficult circumstances, uh, whether they're internal, you know, they, whether it's difficult mental circumstances, difficult physical circumstances, difficult external circumstances, until we're enlightened, those are going to arise, right? And um, and so Buddhism teaches resilience, actually, right? It teaches um, many teachings on how do you meet with those difficulties with mindfulness, with compassion, with finding a sense of meaning, with turning, you know, we often talk about that, right? Uh, transforming suffering into uh, happiness or joy, transforming suffering into something meaningful, transforming suffering into Dharma practice and so on. This is the opposite of that, right? This is where one cannot tolerate one's suffering and one feel, you know, so one is angry that, you know, like, and um, this happens all the time and it's normal human failing, right? And anger, anger of all kinds happens all the time. But so in this one, like a person's angry that they're sick, right? Which, of course, actually, if you, it's kind of, you know, you're angry that you have to wait in line or you're angry that there's traffic, right? Sometimes you're angry, you know, you're angry at the suffering of that, right? Sometimes people get angry at the other driver, but sometimes the person's just angry that, it, that, that oh, I'm stuck in traffic, right? Or somebody gets sick and then you're angry that you're sick. You know, and, you know, what Buddhism is saying, it points out is that, um, you know, if you have a human body, actually, that's a precious, wonderful thing. And part, and if you're not enlightened, part of what goes along with that is the experience. Even, you know, and regardless, if you have a human body, you're going to get sick sometimes, right? Then, if you get angry that you're sick, it compounds the suffering of being sick, doesn't it? So then you're not just sick, but you're also mentally disturbed. Um, so I'm just giving an example, but so that that's an example of uh, anger at one's own suffering, uh, and then anger at the source from which these sufferings arise. That's like, I mean, there's, I mean, there are many examples, countless examples of that, but the, the simple example is like, um. You ever done that? Like if you stub your toe and then you shut, like and then you're angry at the corner of the counter. You know, like people do that, right? Like, or um, see, like where somebody hits a an object, right? Like somebody, you know, people do that all the time, actually, isn't it? You see that people, right? Where that something happens that like the person, uh, you know, hits the object that, that uh, a physical object, which is kind of silly in a way, right? Um, actually, I had patients who had to go, right? Had to go to the hospital. Because they hurt, hurt, you know, because to fix like their hand because they punched something that because they were angry at, at the object, you know. Um, so the point here, it, it, these are all examples, I guess. I'm just pointing out that, right? Anger comes from, as as uh, Vasubandhu said, right? 
anger starts with unhappiness and then compounds your unhappiness, right? It's actually, um, yeah, when you think about it, it's uh, disturbing. Um, uh, you know, but so so that's where, and again, the real, and it says here, the sources from which these, which these sufferings arise. I would argue, and it's an interesting phrasing, but the, it's actually the real source of the suffering is your own karma. That's not what you're getting angry at. It's the source in which you think your suffering arises, right? So like, you know, you stub your toe against the rock. And actually, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Like, because that's what it's referring to when it says the source, right? So then you're angry at the rock, for example, right? But actually, first of all, it's your karma. Secondly, it's your own toe, right? And it was, uh, it was like the suffering really arose from your toe uh, and from your action of not walking carefully or whatever. Um, but we blame the rock and then we're angry at the rock, you know, or we blame the other person and we're angry at the other person. Um, so uh, anyway, you get the idea. There are three objects of observation of anger. I hope you're starting to get the sense, though, right, of how anger is. The idea here is as you contemplate anger, actually, because it's the first step in a way of working with anger is you start to if you contemplate what anger is and how it works that you start to what's the word become horrified actually um you know and not at other people's anger but at your own you know like in other words like at, horrified at the um and how destructive it is at the sheer foolishness of it uh you know that that we are that it's in one way it's very human it's very sentient beings that get angry so it's not that it's um something unusual it's not something to be ashamed of for example or something right like it's well i guess it is something to be ashamed of technically in buddhism although i don't like the word shame but <laughs> in the sense of uh i don't mean that in the I, don't, I mean like in the global sense of uh anybody know what i mean uh it, you know it's it, but my point is just um if you contemplate what anger is then you really want to get rid of it, is my point. You want to overcome it. You want to practice the antidotes to it. And the main antidote to anger is love, by the way. Right? In other words, in Buddhism, if you look in the uh, Lam Rim teachings, where they talk about calm abiding objects, it says, if your mind tends towards anger, then the best meditation to do is on love, because love is an antidote to anger. Um, you know, So meditation on love is a way of decreasing your anger, because if you love other, actually, and that's an important point, if you love others, you can't, Actually, I want to point something out, actually. First of all, love, if you meditate on love, why is that an antidote to anger? First of all, if you meditate on love, you're immediately happy. But actually, you know, if you think of the happiest moments of your life, um, mostly they'll be connected to love, actually. Um, so one point is, if you meditate on love, you're happy, therefore you're not angry. Secondly, if you meditate on love, you see others as precious, right, and as worthy of happiness so you can't develop malice to them while you're in love with them right um you know you cherish others right uh so you don't disregard them and feel mentally distant from them and want to harm them so you know there are two i mean there are various reasons why love is an antidote to anger one is it makes you happy therefore you're not miserable and wanting to hurt people secondly you see others as precious therefore you don't want to harm them and you don't mentally distance from them so um so the idea here is that if you contemplate these teachings on what is anger, you think, oh my gosh, I, I, I want to meditate on love all the time. You know, go off and, and or go around meditating on love. Go wherever I am, meditate on love. You know, and that's what happens actually, right? It was like, I was giving the example, I remember once uh, doing that, I, I, no, I don't have a commute. When I had a commute, there was a point where I thought, oh wow, I was getting, like sometimes I was feeling angry sitting in traffic, it was many years ago. Like, and then I thought, oh my, from now on, I'm going to meditate on love when I drive. And then, um, you know, and then you look around and you think, oh, these are the people I'm practicing bodhicitta for. How wonderful I get to be around them. This is like the perfect place to meditate on love, actually, right? Like, then, then it becomes like wonderful. Oh, there's a traffic jam. This is good. These are all the people, you know, it was much better than being in my meditation room where I can't see them. You know, now they're right around and, and um, I can see that they're suffering and then it's easier to develop compassion for them and so on. Um, you know, so that's the idea is that you do that, right? And that's the antidote to anger. So anger, you know, and the point here is overcoming anger, you don't get rid of, uh, Shanti Deva says, right? Actually, I always think that's funny. Shanti Deva says, um, you can't cover the whole earth in leather, but if you put leather, you know, if you, if you wear shoes, then your feet are protected. And uh, so he's saying if you develop patience, you can't eliminate all the external causes of anger, but if you develop patience in your own mind, then you won't become angry at uh, people. And um, 
actually, I remember once uh, was it Bob Thurman said something like uh, that. He, you know, Shanti David said that as a kind of joke, right? Like, of course, nobody would ever try to pave the planet. But then, you know, he didn't know. Uh, he was uh, living in India and didn't know um, our culture, which actually would try to, you know, try sometimes is, seems to be trying to pave pave uh, too much of the planet. Um, but anyway, the idea is that you just you just cover your own mind, right? You protect your own mind. Um, so then uh, it says regarding the teachings on the nine bases of malice, the precious garland, which is a teaching by uh, Nagarjuna, says harmful intent arises from nine causes of intending harm uh, to others, bearing senseless misgivings in the three times with regard to oneself, one's friends, one enemy. So what's that saying? What he's pointing out here is that and. Uh, Okay, so what is there? Nine. He, he, this is a teaching on the nine bases of malice, um, and what it's saying is the nine bases are these: is you could, that people become angry at uh, when this is in reference to other people or other sentient beings. Yeah, so it'd be becoming angry at those who have harmed, are harming, or who you believe will harm yourself. That's three, right? So you actually, and this is you know if you think about it, right? So you can think. Actually, it's it's funny. Again, I'm just reflecting today on how insane it is, right? So, like, have harmed, right? That'd be like, so if I'm sitting around, it's bizarre in a way, right? I mean, we do this. We all do this at times. Like, we're human, normal human beings who are not practicing Dharma in the moment. But it'd be where, like, you're sitting around and you can do anything with your precious human mind, right? But you think, oh, one time this person harmed me. And then you think, oh, I'm so mad at them. How could they have done that? Right? And they're not there, right? They're not in front of you, right? But of all the things you could choose to think about, and we do this. I mean, it's like, it's actually, if you step back and think about it, it's totally insane, right? What Buddhism is pointing out here is like, you have this amazing mind, right? That can think of universal love, that can think of universal compassion, that can realize emptiness, whatever, that can do all kinds of things, right? And instead, what we do is we think, wow, once this person or this group of people harmed me, they're terrible. And then you sit around thinking about how mad you are at them, right? Um, and actually, if you just think about that, it's like totally insane, right, to do that, but we do it. So that's one basis of anger. Another is who is harming, right? That'd be where in the present something's happening and you're angry at that person. Then the future or will harm, right? That's where you imagine somebody may harm you. Like, so you, they haven't harmed you, right? But you think this person, I've done something I've done, where I, I can think of it, it's really funny, where you think this person could do this, and that would really be terrible for me. You know, and then I'm like, oh, oh and if they do that, then I'll have to do this. And then I'll strategize somehow. And, and, you know, I'll take this measure if they do that measure. You know, and then like, I remember one time I had a boss. I was like, oh, it was like 30 years ago. I had a boss where I thought he was after, like, I thought he didn't, I mean, he kind of didn't like something I'd done. And, and but so I started going, oh, he may do this and then he'll try to get me fired. And then I'll have to do that. And, and then like, I went to see him and I, and I said, oh, and I was thinking about it on the weekend. And then on Monday I went in and I was talking to him and he was like, basically, I mean, he was drunk all weekend with his, you know, he was partying and drunk. I was like, <laughs> I was thinking about like, oh, he may do this, let me do that. He was drunk and was partying with his friends and wasn't thinking about any of that. He was like, that was, you know, that was his reality. And I was totally wasted. I was like, oh, I just wasted hours of my time worrying about, you know, and being angry at him in a way about, because I thought he would harm me, although that wasn't even, he never did. It was a stupid waste of time. Um, so you see my point here, that those are the three future, uh, those are the three in relation to yourself. Then there are three in relation to your friends or those you cherish, right? So those who have harmed, are harming, or will harm your friends, right? And um, or your loved ones or something, right? And so that's where like you get the idea, right? You, it's the same thing, right? So you think this person might do this to my best friend or my whoever, my family member, or my whoever it is, right? And then you um, or they have that they have done that or they are doing it or they may even someday in the future do it, um. And then you use your precious mind. We use, it's just funny as I think about it, that we do this, right? Um, and again, like, you know, part of the point here is in many cases, right, they, if you contemplate these examples, right, who have done, well, it's not happening now, right? May in the future do or are doing. And in each of those cases, uh, if you, I mean, if you think about what he's getting at, it's, we, uh, what a waste of time. Um, and then the last category is because it was nine, right? So those are uh, three, six, and now the last three are those who have helped, are helping, or may in the future help your enemies, right? 
and so that's the last category is where you think that's where it says enemies down here this is oneself one's friends and one en enemy so so there you think this person might in the future help my enemy and so on and uh what's Nagarjuna here saying you know this is Nagarjuna right so he's saying um what Nagarjuna is saying is human beings do that all the time we think these ways and it's a complete utter waste of a human life you know the precious moments of our human life to do that so stop doing it and instead go meditate on love you know or go meditate on emptiness or go meditate on patience um because you're creating your own suffering right in the present and in the future when you do this and so he's actually you know it's like a kind but what's the word kind loving but strict parent who's saying you do this you know and because i love you i'm telling you you're causing yourself suffering so stop <laughs> you know uh because this is how you create your own suffering reality you know um so then uh then uh, our author quotes lama Tsongkhapa, his great exposition on lamrim and sages the path it says anger is malice a harsh mind that observes sentient beings suffering and the sources of suffering such as weapons and thorns and intends to harm those objects um right so there it implies again so anger includes this intent to harm or this wish to harm uh it's in the very nature so i want to differentiate there also if you're just suffering right if you're having a suffering experience due to your previous karma and you're just suffering that's not anger right so in other words like so if, let's say somebody comes up to you and is shouts at you or something right and your mind suffers i just want to point something out that suffering in your mind like so the you're hearing that person's sound right coming from their voice actually because one point is hearing angry words is not a source of suffering it, it's not in and of itself is not intrinsically a source of suffering. actually we pay money to hear that don't we like in other words we buy like um we go to the movies or we pay for netflix to listen to somebody scream at somebody right so like you pay money like you actually all the time right like I mean, there are so many actors who have become famous because they're really good at, you know, like Al Pacino and I don't know, somebody now, you know, Robert De Niro. I mean, there are so many actors who became famous because they're really good at being angry, you know, and they're and we pay money to go see them act, you know. Um, most movies have that actually, don't they? Um, so the angry sound is not what is the cause of suffering, right? It's your so uh, your karma is the cause of your suffering, right? So then you personalize it. You think, oh, that's towards me. How could they say that to me? I'm so wonderful. How could they possibly say an angry sound to me? You know, if they're saying it to somebody else, that could be entertaining, right? We pay, as I said, we pay for that to watch that happen. But when it's towards oneself, right? Um, and so then, um, then we, and then we, uh, anyway, then we develop this wish to harm that other uh, person. So the point I was making though is when you're just having the experience of suffering, that's not anger, right? That's a result of your previous karma um the anger comes when you start to when it when you start to look at that person right and develop malice towards them uh and by the way right i mean actually in that instance what you're you're developing malice towards them for having anger towards you which you now have towards them right it becomes again silly um sujata has her hand up thanks lauren i'm really struggling with this um the wish to harm piece versus simply the, so noticing that there's sort of two and they seem both necessary in order for it to be anger. And so while I hear you that like being on the receiving end of someone's like punching me in the face is if I just suffer, that's not anger. But what if you can't tolerate them without having the wish to harm them? And so I think this is the difficulty I have in my mind of the way, like my sort of, um, um, sort of thinking about it in English, in anger versus hatred. I think I've been dis, dis, discerning between the two in English, such that I've been calling anger uh, that that really negative feeling, that real dislike of that person, the dislike of what they did to me, cannot tolerate it, want it to get away from me. But and and this just might be my lack of um, sufficient. Um, uh, working with my own mind, but there are times when I don't perceive a desire to harm the person who has done it to me. I just find them distasteful. I define what occurred distasteful and want to get them away from me. Right. So there's that, but then there's, there are other times in my life where there's an additional, um, 
you know, whether it's the strategizing or whatever in nonprofit life where I'm like, how am I going to stop that person from doing it and make sure that they never get to be in those kinds of positions of power again because they're evil and, you know, all that nonsense thinking. Um, I mean, sometimes those strategies are necessary to prevent harm, but sometimes they're just like totally a product of my ego and my having feel like people have hurt me or my friends or some concept that I think is important. So really what I'm getting at here is cannot tolerate them alone. Uh, that negative mind, really like the disturbed mind on the basis of having, you know, perceived being harmed, plus the lack of tolerance without the wishing to do harm. What is that? Right. Um, and and I think I have trouble with the difference between anger and hatred. It seems that they're they're used interchangeably in Buddhism. And I, I don't know if there's that kind of differentiation, if there is a thing. And maybe it's just that I lack uh, sufficient awareness of what's happening in my mind that I do actually want to harm the person. But just, you know, just this week, uh, somebody did something that feels hurtful and I just shut the document, didn't keep reading, you know, um, I, I'm not like strategizing or thinking like, how do I make sure that they're, they're doing this harm to my body of work goes away? How do I make sure that they don't get like, I'm not thinking about how to hurt that person at all. And when I think about their face right now, I'm upset with them for what they did, but I'm not, I don't want to hurt him. Like, I kind of think he's a little deluded and whatever. Um, but I do, but I'm experiencing it as anger. Like I'm angry that he did this thing. Right. So I don't know if I'm, I, I guess it's that anger hatred line. Um, and that maybe this is all hatred in, in that wish to harm piece feels really specific. So, um, and seems necessary. It's always with an and in all of these definitions. Um, so I think that's my first question on this. Well, just, I think it's a great question. And I think it's, this is the kind of, I want to point out something. I think what's, I just want to point out for all of, for, um, to you, Strato, and for all of us, like these are the kind of things that are worth contemplating, isn't it? Like it was, if we're going to use these definitions to understand ourselves, right? We have to do what Strato is doing, which is look at our own direct experience in the moment and then say, is that anger? Where's the line? And so I want to read like a couple of things just to clarify first the Buddhist. And I want to be, I want to really follow uh, um Yeshi Gelson and Vasubandhu here. So I'm going to read Vasubandhu for a second. He says, and he and actually, because I think this is interesting, it's getting it, what you talked about. Art translates, interesting, I said this, art in, in, in this book, um, The Inner Science of Buddhist Practice, which is a translation of Vasubandhu, uh, translates, what's translated here is anger, he translates it as hatred. So it really is used interchangeably in that sense. Um, so he's saying, uh, in response to the question, what is hatred? The root, te root text declares animosity towards sentient beings. Then he says, animosity is a harshness of mind towards sentient beings that, if you are overcome by it, will cause you to consider engaging in wrongful conduct, such as killing or binding them. Um, then he says, it, it is an action. It, its action is both is to support both remaining in a discontented state and engaging in misdeeds. Um, actually, I'm just gonna go on. I'm gonna skip a little part, but I'm gonna read a little more just because I think it's interesting. He says, a person who is feeling such animosity will necessarily have a tormented mind because he or she is subjecting himself or herself to mental distress. Because the body is influenced by the mind, his or her body will become distressed as well. He or she will remain in a discontented state uh, that all his or her activities will be accompanied by unhappiness and failure. A person with a hostile mind is never far from every sort of misdeed. Um, for these reasons, the action of hatred is described as being both a support, uh, a support to remaining in a discontented state and for engaging in misdeeds. So he's being very clear. It includes this um, animosity, which is... Um, which would, which again, he's being a clear right. Animosity is a harshness of mind towards that sentient being, and he's saying if you're overcome by it, it will cause you to consider engaging in such wrongful conduct as harming them, essentially, right? And that fits with what our text says, which is, um, it's malice, right? And it says, um, 
you have malice, which is a wish to harm. So, so it includes that. So I want to now go back and get at what you're saying, right? Um, you could say like, it's an interesting point, like up to a certain, like really the way I think, this is how I think of it based on these definitions is that um, one is approaching, you know, uh, what, this, this mental factor, right? This non-virtuous mental factor. Um, you know, as soon as one experiences the unpleasant, one's in danger of giving rise to anger, right? Uh, so one has to guard the mind, right? Uh, then, like, if one starts to get mentally disturbed, right? Like, so first there's, let's say, you know, you, you start to become more mentally agitated by the situation, right? Then you're, you're uh, becoming in greater danger of anger, right? But it's not yet full blown anger because you haven't give, you haven't reached the point of malice or um, what was Art's word? Malice or uh, animosity. That's the word he used. Animosity, which is his translation of the same word, right? Um, which is this wish to harm. So, and then as you like, so I think the point here is that, and then when you think, oh, wow, I've got to get away from this, actually, right? I've got to get away from this situation. Actually, I would argue that's, if if one does that before one gets to the point of actual malice, that's Dharma practice, right? In other words, where you're going, wow, if I stay here much longer, I'm going to develop malice for this person. Let me get away from this person before I want to harm them. You know, um, because that is the root of my own and their, their, you know, then they're going to suffer, I'm going to suffer in the moment, and I'm going to suffer more down the road from karma and so on. So let me leave this, you know, so then if it's possible for me to get away from that situation, both physically and mentally, let me do that. Because, you know, because one knows oneself and one knows if I stay any longer, I'll give rise to um, actual anger, right? So it's like you're, getting closer and closer in a way to that line. And if you stop before it and you sort of say, okay, I'm leaving or I'm going to stop texting or stop emailing or stop whatever, it, you know, whatever it is in, the, in this instance, I would argue that's actually practicing Dharma in the sense that you've gotten right up to like, you know, if you think of like, here's the line of anger, you're getting very close to it. And then you kind of do, and it's, you know, it's like, um, Yeah, anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there. Does that answer your question, though, or not? It does. Thank you. I think, um, I don't know, I feel still feel like that hate that feels like hatred to me, and that anger is the first two, and I, I like just the negative agitated state of mind, it exaggerates the negative qualities of something um, that makes me want to get away from it uh, without the feeling of, like, I'm wondering if there's just another, you know, in English, the way the word anger feels to me is, like I can have a lot of really negative feelings towards the thing that has occurred. And even like the person that like, what was he thinking? Like that kind of stuff. But like, then when I call his face to my mind right now, I love this person, you know, he's a distant colleague, but I like, I'm seeing his face right now. I'm like, Oh, I do actually have really warm feelings to this human being. I think he's really misguided. I think he does a lot of ridiculous stuff, but in my body, when I first read this thing, I mean, it's deep suffering, right? Like I'm tortured by the words on the page. And um, so it does feel like a, a very clear negative mental state mm. that is happening. And it involves both the object of the words on the page. It's him having done this. It's who else has read this now. Oh, just, it's a mess. It's a hot mess. I don't think I want to hurt any of these people. But it's a really negative mental state. I don't know if it's just aversion um, generally, but it, it's really specific to him and the stuff and the and and the way my body is experiencing it, right? It feels like anger. It feels like the heat and the oh, like no, you know. <laughs> um, One question. I don't, you. Maybe I don't. Yeah. Do I want to hurt the words? Do I want to hurt the situation? I don't know that I want to hurt anything. That's what I was wondering. Think of the second two categories. I just don't know. I'm wondering. I mean, I'm not sure about this. It's more of a genuine question. Is 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 there a moment there when you first like? 
because when you think of him because you practice love you think of love but if you, in that first moment when you were reading the words on the page was there what's described here if we if we just use Yeshe Gelson's words was there at least a moment of anger either at one's own suffering or at the source from which these sufferings arise not the person but the like the words on the the words was there a moment of that like you know everyone doesn't want, literally want to punch the computer necessarily but mm -hmm. is there a moment of like wishing one could destroy the existence of that wishing one could mm -hmm. i think that's right lord i think that i mm. would like to grind out the pixels in the page you know <laughs> like that i would like so to that's... there's something that is destructive in my emotions at that moment with regard to the, oh my God, make this stop. I want to make this stop. And there's a, like a fist is forming in my hand, right? Like, I'm not sure towards what, like, what am I going to do to the words on the page, right? That's or it. To so the situation anger. having a, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's anger mm -hmm. towards is really the helpful. source Thank of you. suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten better at not directing my anger towards the humans who cause the suffering, but I am still really angry uh at the thing but so this is where and i think you know we've talked about this book by his holiness the dalai lama called be angry and i know that there's like a lot of like secular stuff that he does you know to attend to folks who aren't you know are not people uh on the on this path right um but there's something very powerful in that book that exhorts us to uh, maintain a feeling of anger towards social injustice right and oppression um and I've really struggled with how I reconcile, you know, and one of my teachers is always reminding me, like, there's stuff the Dalai Lama says to people who aren't practicing the Dharma and that, you know, the Buddha spoken three ways to three different, you know, so be careful about which parts of his advice you're taking on your path, right? So I get that. Um, but there does seem to be that energy, that heat to stop wrongdoing that occurs when you feel that, like, basic limbic backbone of self-esteem for self and others like that harm needs to stop right now mm -hmm. right and and that that energy feels like anger at that moment um i don't necessarily want to hurt the people who are doing the harm but i do really need that thing to stop right now and um i'm just trying to think about what this third piece of then wishing there in order for it to be a Buddhist sense of anger, hatred, how these words are being used interchangeably, it needs that third piece. And I'm curious if on dissection, what his holiness is talking about with regard to maintaining anger. And I think maybe using that word, not in the Buddhist context, but just that the, whatever heat or energy comes up, and this distancing or so this desire for it to not be so this desire to stop it to distance me and everyone else in all beings from these kinds of harm like it's not a pleasant feeling but it doesn't engage this um it doesn't engage this like i mean if anything there's a also a feeling of like oh my gosh they need to not do that for their own future karma like they have to, oh my gosh, like we need to stop it, this for everybody, including the folks causing the harm, right? So I don't know, I'm just, I'm struggling with that. A lot of times I think I'm feeling anger and I'll, I'll do a little bit more, you know, practicing and thinking in real time about if I'm trying to grind the words out on the page or if I'm feeling a desire to destroy my own discomfort or destroy the the fact of the thing occurring at all. Um sort of like the way you described destroying the chair it's like do, yeah. do i want to destroy the words on the page like is there a sort of grinding out or a smashing or burning of the thing so that's really helpful yeah it does i mean a couple of quick thoughts from what you say one is that you made some interesting points i think first of all just in general those were interesting to think about another is i do think it may be that because you're practicing you've gotten better at not directing anger at sentient beings but it may be one of the, I think it sounds like it might be one of these other two categories, either at one's own suffering or at the sort that there might be at least a moment of that, that then gives into your physiology, you know, because that's what he's even, a, and it's interesting, right? We think of mind body and we talk about this, and, you know, Vasu Bandhu wrote that so many centuries ago, you know, but he said the same thing, right? Get, you know, once that happens in your mind, your body, uh, it get, you know, it, uh, your body also gets agitated. Um, so maybe that is another point. 
But then another thing you were making me think about in terms of the, I've actually thought about this a little bit in terms of the social justice, and I don't, I'm no expert on that, I don't know that, but uh, one thing I've been thinking about sometimes is, um, one is like, you know, I was, so, I mean, Jan, you know, I think of back to Jan Willis's uh, talks on um, love and marching with Dr. King uh, herself and so on. And, and her point, like she makes this point that, you know, she tells that story that um, she was in high school and that her classmates would come with her. And then there were these older women at the black church that they would meet at. And the women would talk and, and then like she would go up and she was with some of the guys from her class. And then the woman would ask them, are you ready to go march? And like the guy next to her would be like, yeah. And then the woman would say, you're not coming today. Go sit in the church and meditate on love. You know, and then they say, you guys are coming. You're, you're staying here. Maybe you think about love and maybe you can come tomorrow because, you know, that energy can't be on, the, on our march. So you're not welcome today. And uh where she was getting at something that we're that we're talking about in a way, which was like the woman recognized there was anger in that young man, which was very understandable, but but wasn't welcome in the march uh, that Dr. King was organizing and and and, and those women were organizing together. Um, but then also sometimes I think about this point with Buddhists, like it's interesting, isn't it? Like where you know. Um, it's really hard not to get, I mean, it's hard, it's hard not to get angry at sentient beings. And it's probably even harder to not get angry at the sources from which you think you're, you know, from which we believe our suffering is arising. Uh, that's really hard, actually. And like, and I just sometimes think about this, like the idea in Buddhism is that, you know, one does strong action without any of that is really what this text is getting at. And I often just think about like, how does one do that? And how does a bodhisattva practice in a way where they can, what's the word, have that strong energy, but not even, not only not be angry at the person, but not even be angry in this sense, because anger is the source of suffering is what their view is, right? The Buddhist view is, that's really, I just often think about that. I'm like, wow, that's really, really hard, you know? and um. And that there's still a fierceness. So I often, I don't know, I just often reflect on that. I'm like, wow, how does the person keep that energy and fierceness? And you can see how they would do it without becoming angry at the person because they meditate on love for the person, but they don't even get angry at the um, objects, right? Or the, you know, the, but they still have this incredible energy. And I, I just, anyway, I don't have an answer to that, but it's something I've often thought about. And, um, I just think it's interesting. It's interesting to contemplate that, right? And like, how do you internally get to that place of um, of strength and energy with, you know, that that's not relying on that? It's just an interesting question, anyway. But Lynn has a comment. Question. Um. Since anger is what I've struggled with most of my life up to now, um, I think with the, for me, okay, is if I can get to a place where I'm not angry, then I see things in a different way. And so it sort of takes anger out of the equation. It, so, you know, even though I'm really angry at bad things happening to people, if I'm not personally angry, if it doesn't claw into that part of me, then I can maintain even greater energy and incentive to help make things better. I mean, because if if it keys into my anger, it it it, it takes all my energy to keep my angry there, my anger. And and the stubbing the toes got to me because I've broken bones twice. They were both in my feet. Okay. And I was really angry, but I broke two bones in my foot, not in very different Every times. Time. One, I was furious at a client <laughs> and the other one, it was my partner at the time. And then I was so mad. And so what do I do? I end up like in the emergency room with a broken <laughs> toe. It's crazy, right? But the, the idea that you just harm yourself, you don't, <laughs> You don't help the situation. Yeah. And both avoidable. Both, 
incredibly avoidable. <laughs> there were household accidents, right? One was a tub, one was a weight in my gym bag. I mean, it was crazy stuff. But I think you can keep more energy if you get rid, uh, for me, okay, if, if I get rid of my personal anger, because that takes up so much space in my brain that I, that it takes a lot of energy out of me. And it's, for me, it's hard to do. I mean, your, your example of planning and getting back at somebody, I had an incident this week where somebody referred a client to my former partner, who I don't think is a very good lawyer, but anyway, it didn't make any difference. So now the guy that referred her, who we, I've given personal free legal advice extensively. I'm thinking, I'm going to get back at him if he ever calls me again. And it's all insane. <laughs> it's totally insane. Let it go. But it's taken up so emotion, all this emotional energy that I could devote to other good things, right? So I, I, I think the thing with anger is like, no, I'm really angry at him, but it makes no sense because <laughs> it's only hurting me and mm -hmm. robbing myself of all this energy. So anyway. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. It's interesting. Yeah. Huh. So I I think what Sujatha, I mean, for me, what she's talking about is if you intervene quickly enough, you don't get to hatred or you intervene mm -hmm. as fast as you mm -hmm. can. You don't even get to the anger. Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. It's sort of like early intervention. <laughs> Makes sense. I think it's great just to be thinking about this stuff, you know, and like these are the right, you know, contemplations. And yeah, and I, well, I guess one more thing I'll just share with myself, it, just briefly, is um, that sometimes there's a, for, I know for me anyway, there are times where it's connected to what she taught, where I, I sometimes, it's because of how I was, certain experiences from when I was young. Uh, but like that there's sometimes I have a wrong idea and I have to actually, I always have to go back. Like, I don't know if I, there are times where I have this wrong idea that like, oh, because I was mad or angry, I was more effective in getting something done, which was just something I was taught actually as a kid. Uh, and then I look back and I'm like, that's so wrong. It was like, I look back at real instances and I'm like, actually what solved the problem wasn't that. Like it was something else actually, you know, like, um, but anyway, it's hard. I mean, it's hard work to figure this out in one's own experience, I guess is my point. Um, but I think you guys are asking or contemplating it in helpful ways. So Jonathan. Um, I was curious, Lauren, um, a couple things that um, are all the quotes from Vasubandhu that you're, uh, are they all in Art's book? Um, is that everything you're saying about Vasubandhu coming from that text? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm quoting Vasubandhu. Okay. It's from the Inner Science of Buddhist Practice. Uh, okay, that are great. Translated. And um, the reason why I'm quoting that text quite a bit, actually, this text mentions that text and oftentimes is quoting that text. So a lot of times <laughs> what I'm doing is just going to a different translation of the same passage. And sometimes what happens is um, Yeshe Gelson will quote Vasubandhu. But then if I go back to Vasubandhu, he adds a few more words like, um, you know, like uh, uh, Yeshe Gelson sometimes will leave out, you know, we'll just quote part of a sentence, you know, part of a paragraph. So I'll go to Vasubandhu's text in order to see the rest of that paragraph. So, um, and then what's the what's the text, uh, the Vasubandhu text itself? That um, uh, the Vasubandhu text is called. Uh, uh, Art translates the title as uh, it's called a uh, Vasubandhu summary of the five heaps or, or five aggregates. So five heaps, with commentary by Srimati. So okay. it's uh, he actually translates Vasubandhu's summary of the five heaps, uh, and then he also includes in the text um, a commentary to it by. Uh, uh, Acharya Srimati. Um, and uh, she's seeing, I don't know if I'll find it. Uh, in, um, yeah, it, it comes later. I'm not going to find it right now. Later in, in our text, in, in uh, Yeshi Gelson's text, which is what we're studying, he actually says in it, uh, I will, we'll come, I mean, we'll actually get to it eventually, but oh, here it is. Actually, uh, on, on page 90, I'll re just read a sentence from Yeshi Gelson. He says, um, in order to understand the defining characteristics of the afflictions, the mental afflictions, listen to explanations on Abhidharma. At the very least, listen to an explanation of Vasubandhu's discussion of the five aggregates. <laughs> so 
he said, uh, which he uh, art trends is a summary of the five arguments. He says a discussion of the five arguments. Uh, the translator here, but it's the same text. So, you know, so um, there's a section in Yeshi Gelson's text where he says, "Study that text." Um, oh, and he's quoting Gompawa saying that. So, so the idea is that you know Yeshi Gelson covers this material, and actually, I think in some cases Yeshi Gelson gives more information, but sometimes. Uh, Vasubandhu and Srimati give a little more a little more explanation of certain passages. So for me, it's been useful to go back and forth. Um, okay. Me. And then one last thing, I don't know if we're going to get to this later in class, um, but around antidotes, um, it was interesting. I heard patience is the primary antidote to anger. And then you talked about love today. And I was just wondering if there's anywhere, if you know, if people talk about curiosity as an antidote. So like, um, if any of the teachers have named specifically, like when I when I can go as quickly as possible to, oh, you know, like what happened to you that you did that to me, or what happened that that this has occurred, it sort of immediately dissipates my anger. If I try to be curious about the causes and conditions, I'm just wondering if there's anything, if you knew of anything that that discusses that. Well, that's an interesting question. Huh. First of all, it totally makes sense. I mean, it's very clear that would that that's a smart thing to do. Um, you know, the, but it's interesting. At least that word. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I don't, you don't you don't see really Buddhist texts use the word curiosity, do you? Like I'm thinking of Shai, like the main teachings on uh, on patience that I've studied are um, you know Shanti Deva's beautiful chapter in the Guides of the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, and then like in the Lam Rim, there are extensive teachings on patience. For example, but I can't think of any Buddhist text that uses that has a word that they've translated as curiosity. You know, you think of like American Buddhist teachers will sometimes talk about curiosity, uh, but I like I've never heard a Tibet, you know when a Tibetan Lama is talking, I've never heard a translator use the word curiosity that I can even ever remember actually, which is just an interesting point. So I'm not sure that it's you know. And at the same time, like as you, as you well know, uh, you know, Tibetan monks are very curious people. Uh, many of them, who I know, but and you know some of the same ones, even you know, but but they don't use that word really. As I think, of. I, I can't think of a time, even in like English, like I mean, Tibetan monks I know who speak English quite well, who are among the most curious people I know. I mean, learn about all kinds of things. I don't, I've never heard them use that word actually that I can remember. So it's a, or, maybe a yeah, or related, question. yeah, or related words like wonder, awe, like those kinds of like anything that would like tap into that, like getting at the interdependence that gave rise to the situation. I mean, there's more like analysis or something instead of they like would use that word. Mm -hmm. That's weird mm -hmm. though, isn't it? Like I can't think of a Geshe who I know, for example, who's used the word wonder, awe, or curiosity. In English. I'm just saying, so it's a linguistic issue, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, Lynn. I think it might not exist. I mean, this is my theory, because if you get rid of mental afflictions, all those, uh, how do you say, uh, curiosity, wonder, they all just arise in you. If you can get rid of those mental afflictions, there's just more room for all of that. Yeah. So, um, like curiosity strikes me as a therapeutic world, therapists use it. Yeah. But I, I also think that if you get rid of all the anger and attachment and all that crap, <laughs> however we do it through meditation, then the other stuff is there. I mean, that's yeah. the way I'd see it. Yeah, they, I mean, as I think about it, you're right. Like the Tibetan monks, I know, they, it's just taken for, I mean, granted. taken for granted in a negative sense, but it's sort of like, well, of course you want to, like, you know, um, I mean, the Dalai Lama writes studying watches and how they work. And I mean, I think of like, right. just think of like, I'll often, I mean, I, so many times I'm friends with Tashi, Ken Sarimbache's assistant, attendant. And there's so many times where I'm like, how do you know how to install flooring? Or how do you know how to take care of fruit trees? Or how do you know how to, and like, he'll just say, he won't say I was curious. He won't say, he'll just say like, I learned, you know, I was like, how'd you learn how to tile this, put in a tiling in the bathroom, like in the center? this is beautiful tiling job you don't like how did you know that and he's like 
he'll just look at me like, what do you mean? Like, how do I, like, I don't, he'll just sort of look at me like, he won't answer, he'll just like look at me like, what do you mean? How do I, like, right. how does anybody learn anything? You know, it's kind of like, that's just, I mean, he won't say, he's very kind, so he wouldn't say that's a stupid question, but he'll kind of look at me like, well, how would anybody learn about Thailand? Like, you know, it's sort of like, so I don't know. Yeah, it's funny, like, but he won't say I'm, I'm curious and I have a wide range of interest. Like, that's kind of funny. Like you're saying, it's just, it doesn't, yeah, if you don't have mental afflictions, you have a lot of time. The time I would have spent worrying about somebody at work who was... <laughs> spent, yeah, exactly. Creativity and all the rest. I mean, you, your mind is at peace, so you can learn all these things and do all these things and think all these things. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's almost like... Um, the norm is the opposite. In other words, it's the negative of all the afflictions. So the norm is learning things, creativity. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it, that's the norm. Yeah. And what we have that we have to get rid of, well, I have that I have to get rid of is all the attachment and the hatred and the anger and all of that because there's not room for the others. To... No, yeah, I totally think you're right. But that's just the norm so they don't use yeah they don't use those words but it's their normal yeah culture hmm. oh frank go ahead. yeah um so the the strategy of uh uh of remembering that you know things that happen to us that make us uh, angry are the cause from our previous causes for our previous karma um so yeah i find that difficult to remember at the time when these things are happening you know when things happen even minor annoyances or things like that yeah you because know, I've, I've i've you know reflected upon the meditations on patients for a long time and that's the first one right mm -hmm. remember that it's you know don't set up the target or and, and and so i don't know if you had any tips about how to remember that because i intellectually i can understand how powerful it would be that i don't want to you know recreate the causes uh, that created this situation, so I should practice love, um, other than continuing to reflect upon it. But if you had any tips about how to be more aware of that as these things occur, I, one is I just I, it is hard. I think you're right. Um, huh. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only two things I can think, I mean, they're not really, I mean, one is I think it's hard. Things are, one is, I mean, obviously, it's, as you said, it's habituation, it's practice that helps. But the other is, I guess the other part that occurs to me that I think can help, because if I think of, um, let me say it the right way. The other thing I think that, the other thing that I believe may help sometimes is, um, say it very well. apart from our own effort you know in practice is who we is is exposure to others who view the world that way like um in other words like i guess I, part of what i think makes that harder is if you live in a context where as many of us do where um on a day-to-day -day level every single person you come across doesn't view the world that way I think that makes it harder. Like if you grew up in a context where, I guess I'll say it from my own experience, to be honest. Like I grew up in a context where the explicit message was, if you're suffering, it's because of somebody else and you should you know, uh, fight back or whatever. And then the people I'm around for most of my life, that's their worldview. That makes it harder. you know. And, th and then when I'm, for me personally, if I spend time, I can think of when I spent time with Reba Rinpoche, uh, who was the op, you know, who said, you know, who, when he said, oh, when I was tortured for years in a Chinese prison, you know, I got to purify my karma. And you're with an actual person who views the world that way and then says, so I had love for the torture. For me, that had that chain, you know, like that helps, I guess. And so I guess it's like also exposing ourselves to people who who share that worldview makes it easier because it's it's hard actually especially if you're living in a culture 
you know, if the so there is, if you, if everything you see on, um, whatever, you know, so if, if the people we're actually in person with, and then also the stuff we're exposed to through digital input has the opposite worldview, then even if we're thinking about that sometimes, I think that makes it harder personally. So I guess like whether it be through reading stories or actual people or, you know, or inviting people who love us, you know, like who we're close to, to remind us of that worldview and to sort of bring that back into the discussion. Um, you know, so actually inviting that from people, you know, it has to be from somebody you trust and want to want that from, but I think that helps actually for me. Yeah, thank you. And Lynn. Um, I don't want to talk too much, but I know I am. Um, I think Frank's question is, uh, is particularly poignant because we're going through, I, I think, okay, uh, sort of transformation of worldviews. And so everybody in the world is changing right now, or at least the ones we know about, which is really, really hard to do. And so we're talking about doing it on a personal level, but I think the world as we know it is going through the same paradigm shift, the same transition, which are really, really is really, really hard. So I guess realizing that I think for me personally makes it easier to know people suffer when you do that. <laughs> I suffer when I do that because it's a really hard thing to do to change your worldview and to change the way you live. It's just hard. Yeah, I agree. Actually, one more thing, I guess I want to say just in support of that, as you said that, Lynn, it made me think of something. Else. One is, so, you know, that, that does connect to, what's the word, to being in connection with others who share a perspective that we're trying to cultivate. But I think it also is feeling free to verbalize, you know, like in a world where, I guess I'll say that too, like in our world, there people feel very free to verbalize even hateful uh, perspectives. And so I guess the other thing that I personally think may be good for the world actually is to feel free to cult to to verb to both to 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 connect with people who share a worldview that we're trying to cultivate, but also to feel free to verbalize our own worldview. You know, because I think sometimes there's like a sense of um, I feel that personally, like you know, in other words, you know, oh, if somebody is is verbalizing a hateful worldview that's considered sort of normal. But I better be really careful. I don't like somehow I'm supposed to be careful not to say, you know, that um that I want to that I'm trying to cultivate joy in the in my own difficult moment through embracing a perspective of karma. Oh, don't say that. You know, um, and that's ridiculous in a way. And, and I, I realize like sometimes I I catch myself sort of feeling like that. And that the that sometimes I think I need to be able to just say that's my that's what's true for me. And also. I don't know that if the world is going through, as you said, Lynn, if the world is going through a strange time, the worldviews that are vocalized affect each other, you know, and and we affect each other by what we say and how we act. And so anyway, I think that's another one is feeling free to also, because if we never say that out loud, it's also, as Frank was pointing, you know, if I just think that, but I never say it, but I say other things, well, it's harder to remember it because it's not part of my social reality. Um, it's only in my own mind or something because I live, you know, if I think that I live in a world where the only ver the only things that are supposed to be spoken are a limited range of things that aren't in accordance with what I actually believe, that's not a good habit. Um, but then, uh, yeah, keep going. Um, Okay, so where we left off. So then it says, uh, he's talking still about anger. So now uh, our author says, it has the function of causing one not to abide in happiness in this lifetime and produces immeasurable suffering in future lives. So that's quite clear, isn't it? So he's saying, um, as I said earlier, right? In the moment, in this life, when we cultivate, actually, there, I want to point out, there are numerous things being implied here, though. One is, in the moment when you're angry, you're not abiding in happiness in this life. Also, this is very clear, right? That's one. Number two is if you, the, when when I when we get angry, we're habituating our mind to anger, so then we're going to get angry again and again and again in this life. 
each time we allow, and this is clear even in, I mean, this is clear from a Buddhist perspective in terms of how the mind works. It's also clear from a neuroscience perspective. Each time you get angry, you're habituating your nervous system to anger. You're habituating your brain to anger. That's very clear now. And so, you know, each time your nervous system gets flooded with anger, you're, you're literally, you know, what's they say, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, and your neurobiology is influenced by your experience anyway. Blah, blah, blah. So the point is, is that you're literally making your brain and body more likely to be angry each time you flood your system with anger, you know, uh, they flood your body and mind with anger. Um, and then what this text is saying is that also carries on to future lives, right? And, you know, the ultimate expression of anger from a karmic perspective is hell, you know, and um, <clears throat> anyway, so the, I mean, the, you know, that the ultimate, that's the kind of ultimate expression of anger is kind of a, a hell and, and um, anyway, so yeah, then uh, Shanti Deva, then in this vein, Shanti Deva and the guides of the Bodhisattva's deed says, if one maintains a painful mind of hatred, right? Hatred and anger are used interchangeably, right? So point is here, first of all, it's painful in and of itself, as I was saying. The mind does not experience peace. That's quite true, isn't it? Nor obtain joy and happiness. Sleep does not come and there is no stability. So you can check your own experience, right? What's he saying there? When you're angry, and this is where you reflect on this, right? When you go back to times when you're angry, right? Or notice it, right? Your mind is not at peace. You can't, and actually, you, there is no joy. You do not obtain joy and happiness. That means, what's he getting at there? You can check your own experience, right? If you're angry, even if you have the finest food or the finest gathering, whatever you get, to, you can't enjoy it, right? In other words, like you can't. Actually, it's quite clear, even biologically, you can't digest food well when you're angry, right? It's not. Um, you can't. You know, I, I remember. Um, You ever notice that like even if you go to the finest you know if, like actually if, if somebody went to a nice vacation but you're with somebody who's totally enraged it's not you'd rather not be there right um then sleep does not come right actually um right if you're angry you can't sleep well right either you won't fall asleep or you'll wake up in the middle of the night you know upset about whatever you're angry about when you fell asleep um and then there's no stability, right? That means the mind can't settle down, right? And the mind isn't stable. The mind is agitated and ruminating and yeah, agitated. This is the right word. Then it says, he saddens his friends, he or she, right? That's true, isn't it? In other words, when you're angry, even the people who like you will be unhappy and difficult. You're difficult. <laughs> that, right, you create, actually, when we're angry, we create an unpleasant environment for others, isn't it? And even if you're not talking, you do that, don't you? Like we do that, you know. So there's even a, if you're talking, it upsets people. But even if you're quiet, even if you even if I'm quiet, if I'm angry, I'm hard to be around, right? Um, then it says he gathers them with generosity, but is not served. Uh, in brief, joy does not exist in one where anger abides comfortably, right? And um, that's quite true, isn't it? And there's what that's getting at. Shanti Deva goes into more about this, right? Even if an angry person is generous. Like people in general, you like being around somebody who's generous, right? But if the person's angry, have you seen that happen where it's like, what's the word? Then actually, first it becomes where a person, other people are like, you know, well, I hate being around this person, but I guess I'll go because they're going to give me something, you know? Uh, and then eventually they stop showing up. Or the person, when the person stops giving, they stop showing up at the minimum, but depending on how much they're giving or whatever. It happens in families, doesn't it? You hear people like that, you know? Um, it also happens among friends. So the point here is like, you know, generosity is ruined by anger, right? The, the effect, because the point of generosity is to make people happy, but it's not happy if it's accompanied by anger. Um, and again, this idea that you can't find joy, right? There is no room for joy if your mind is angry. Um, and then uh, in the Garland of Bird Stories, which are like uh, Jataka tales, um, it says, uh, so this is by the Buddha. It says, due to the fire of anger, and that's a common metaphor, right, for anger, fire. Uh, is it, what is it? Uh, due to the fire of anger, one colors unflatteringly, even adorned with ornaments, one does not look good, even though one may lie in a comfortable... Oh, so the first part here, um, say it somewhere else too. Um, I guess not. Uh, there's a teaching actually that they, they make, which it says this, that uh, 
in the moment, first of all, like the Dalai Lama often points this out, and other lamas, and Shanti Deva says it in more detail too. He says, you know, when you get angry, actually, your countenance becomes unpleasant, right? Um, there is some, even somebody who usually you would enjoy seeing. If you see their face when they're angry, you want to uh, get away from them. They don't look, uh, you know, you, you look disturbing, maybe frightening, actually, right, or disturbing. Um, and what they say, actually, what, and, and even with adornments, it doesn't matter, right? Even if you're dressed quite beautifully, if you're angry, you don't look good. What they're saying there, one is in the again, this, this is a teaching, uh, Buddhist teaching that in the moment it's unpleasant to be around somebody, but also they say uh, a karmic seed of anger leads to looking unpleasant in the future lives. So that you know, if, they actually, it's funny, sometimes they joke, right? Like people spend a lot of money on, um, I guess that used to be, I guess it used to, well, I don't know, creams or lotions or surgeries or whatever, uh, hair dyes and all kinds of things. Um, what they're saying is like patience is the best. They so they say patience is the best uh, cause of beauty. <laughs> so they say practice patience, and you'll be beautiful. Practice anger, and you'll be unattractive. Uh, and they say that for this life, but also for future lives is the point. Um, that that's the cause of that for future lifetimes. Then even though one may lie on a comfortable bed, one's mind suffers due to the agony of anger. Right. So your mind is agitated and unhappy, and it doesn't matter how comfortable your circumstances are, you'll be uncomfortable forgetting the benefits one has enjoyed tormented by anger one proceeds on a bad path right and um actually that, there's that teaching that um i mentioned this once before but uh, this past year when ken Rinpoche was on the east coast it was quite beautiful he kept bringing up this teaching where he said um there's a phrase in tibetan sem sangpo like they translate usually the good heart right yeah, meaning uh it could have different meanings uh but the ultimate meaning of it is bodhicitta or love or compassion and it, what he says is a line from uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, where he says, you know, if you have a good heart, the Samsangpo, then your path will be good and your ground will be good. If you have a bad heart, or don't have the good heart, then your path will be bad and your ground will be bad. You know, where you go will be bad. So this is saying that, that if your anger is the, actually, uh, and both Chandra Kirti and Shanti Deva said, say, if there is no evil in the mind greater than anger or hatred. So the idea here is that if your mind is if your mind is overcome or tormented by anger or hatred, then by definition your path will be bad and where you're going will be bad. Um, yeah, that's true. Then it says it says one's reputation and achievements degenerate like the waning moon; one's glory fades, um, and that's particularly I think. I often have to think about that. I think that's particularly true in the context of Dharma, right? And there is a, from a Dharma perspective, there is no achievement. If you're angry, there is no achievement. There's no, actually, if you're angry, there's no Dharma practice left, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, in other words, if you're comfortably angry, if you're not working against it, then there's nothing, then you're not practicing Dharma. Um, of course, I, I sometimes have to think about that one because in our culture, there are examples, I think, where sometimes people, um, gain a certain amount of reputation by being angry, maybe, but not from a Dharma perspective, anyway. Um, then it says, although supported by friends due to anger, one plummets senselessly into the abyss. Um, one point there is like, if you're angry, actually one point, one way of think of that line is, uh, it doesn't matter how many friends you have or what resources you have or what, you know, anything else. Actually, if you, for example, if you die when you're angry, you'll go to the lower realms. That's a that's a clear teaching. So, there is if you die when you if you die angry, it activates karma related to anger, which leads to rebirth in lower realms. So, um, so we don't want to habituate ourselves to anger because if we're habituated to it, then we won't be able to help it. You know, in, when we're dying, we're in pain, right? Oftentimes, and in difficult, it's not a pleasant circumstance. So, if we get angry over small negative circumstances now, then we can say, oh, I'll probably be getting angry at that time. So, it's another reason to work on patience. Um, then one's contemplation of benefit and harm degenerates, one becomes erratic and confused. And that's quite true, isn't it? When we're, if you're really angry, you can't think clearly. You know, the Dalai Lama on points that out, that like, we make bad decisions, basically, when we're angry, and we're, our mind is erratic and can't see clearly, you know, uh, because we're not realistic when we're angry. Then um, due to anger, one becomes habituated to misdeeds, which is true, right? Um, and we'll experience 
suffering for hundreds of years and bad migrations. Even an enemy who goes to great lengths to inflict great harm cannot manage more than this. So he's saying the real enemy is anger, right? Uh, external enemies. Actually, it's weird, isn't it? Like, you know, have you ever noticed it? Like, like in the comments of an external enemy, oftentimes nowadays, <laughs> it used to be for a few minutes in person. Now it's oftentimes just that, as Sajata was giving an example, it pops up on your screen, right? Like you see it on your phone or on your computer. Um, which actually we have total control over. We can just turn it off, but we don't. And then, um, but it's just something we actually look at, right? And then our mind can be agitated for so long due to something like that um, is one point. Another point just to make the, uh, is where it says here, due to anger, one becomes between the seeds, is uh, just another quick point is, again, it's just disturbing if you think about it, right? Like Lama Zomarshi points this out about over lifetimes. He says, if you, you know, if you allow anger, Lama Zomarshi makes a point related to that, which is if you allow anger to stay in your, to stay as a habit in your mind, then eventually you'll be like the despots who cause so much suffering. You know, there's like, they're just people controlled by anger, right? Um, so, you, you know, like, whether, like, you think of, like, you know, the current war that was initiated by uh, Putin, or you think of Stalin, or Mao, or Hitler, or all these other examples, who started entire wars, right, and killed um, so many people. Lama Zobrishim, he says, that's just anger, right? And so don't think they're intrinsically different than you. He's point, if you allow your mind to stay habituated to anger, and then you create some good karma, which actually we do, you know, because we take we practice things. Then he said, like, your good karma can lead to some kind of wealth or power or something, but your mind is still habituated to anger. Then he said, actually, that's how you create despots. You know, that's how you create really uh, people who do the worst things. So he makes this point. He says, so especially if you're creating some good karma, then be really careful because you're if you leave your mind habituated to anger, your good karma could result in um if you if you still have anger then it can result in you know, well, a good result mixed with anger or hatred which then it has a horrifying result so you make this point so so overcome anger your enemy right that's the real enemy is your own anger in your mind um then you'll never harm anybody you know there is a if you overcome the mental afflictions in general then you won't harm people and if you overcome anger then you won't harm um large numbers of people because the point is is like you know for the most part where do and this is the last thing i'll say about anger you know if you contemplate it here you know um it's just obvious isn't it but like everything from your own bad night's sleep to the problems in families to the problems in between countries you know to wars um they don't all come about through anger because some of them come about through craving and some of them come about through jealousy but most of them come about through anger. Um, you know, so, um, you know, anger itself leads to, you know, I mean, all kinds, you know, anyway, all kinds of horrifying uh, behaviors. And that's what we're getting at is don't think you're not, you know, that's what the teaching is saying here is don't think we're not capable of them. We are, you know, and, and that's, but if we cultivate love, you know, that's the antidote, right? If we cultivate, as Frank was pointing out, an awareness of karma, if we cultivate, um, you know, there are many antidotes, right? Uh, as Sujanta pointed out, curiosity, uh, you know, empathy, um, you know, and also what sort of realistic perspectives, right? In order so that if we tend to, um, you know, demonize, right? Because anger exaggerates, then an answer to that is also seeing the good qualities of those, you know, objects of anger and so on. Um, so there are many, and, and, and uh, if we want to study more on the um, antidote to anger, the Lamrim teaches them, but Shanti Deva, there's no better I don't think, text than Shanti Deva's pa patience chapter, chapter six, and the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. It's probably the best treatment uh, that I know of of um, patience. <clears throat> but um, okay, and well, and so if you any uh, any other comments or questions, that, that's the section on anger. Any other comments or questions on that topic before? Anyway, I really, I do think though it's useful to come back to that. And again, this idea, of like, because I think Shadatta's first question got at it, which is, you know, that we can get agitated in our mind, but if we're careful, if we start, if by through thinking about this, it's like, 
you know, as you're starting to approach the actual malice, you know, um, you know, and I guess I'll say it this way, like, you know, because anger is like, like a flame, right? They give this example, like a fire that catches fire and can burn down every, you know, so it's something that destroys your good karma. Shanti Deva goes into great detail about how anger destroys our good karma and it creates a lot of negative karma. Like, the Buddhist point would be do whatever you can. Like if you have to, if you have to literally run, like, like, you know, like run out of the room, whatever, run away, you know, good, like run away. That's fine. That's not a bad karma. You know, like we often think of the opposite, right? Like we think, you know, I don't know, whatever, we think all kinds of things. But what Buddhism is saying is like, actually Buddhism is really saying, I'll use hatred as the word here, that anything's better than hatred, actually. You know, like, so there is anything you can do is better than being hateful. Um, so whatever you have to do to not be hateful, do that. Um, but Shadate, go ahead. I was, oh, I've talked a lot and I see John's hand, so I'll be really brief. I was thinking that in, in lieu of curiosity, what might actually be happening is compassion. Um, so it's like that that sense of like what happened to you that you did that to me or what are the causes and conditions it might actually be more of a compassion practice. Um, so just realizing that those words, curiosity, et cetera, are not, um, I existing sort of in, in the Tibetan or, or the way in which this is taught, um, just the stand in for that might actually be compassion. Uh, um, good. so that was just something I wanted to work out. That really makes sense. That's cool. And then John. Yes. Yeah. You just said something, which I'm just curious about. You said the most important is to like run away from the anger. <clears throat> we're only on the sixth, there's six root afflictions of which we're only on the second. Is there a priority that anger is the biggest one to avoid or are all six equal? On the one hand, all six are the are causes of suffering. So we want to eventually, you know, if you want to practice um, Dharma, we have to, eventually, if you want to achieve liberation, for example, you have to overcome all of the mental afflictions. But um, Shanti Deva and also Chandra Kirti say, you know, from a, that actually they say there's no evil greater than anger. You know, so if, if we're going to follow Shanti Deva and Chandra Kirti, which we do <laughs> as Mahayana Buddhists, then uh, they, they would say anger is the, in some ways, I guess I'll say a couple of things. One is they say, actually in Buddhist practice, they, they say, um, anger is the most destructive in terms of like, it, because it, you know, anger destroys our positive. When we dwell in anger, it destroys our positive karma. It like uh, or destroys it. It makes it unri unripenable. It's like burning a seed, they say. So it, it kind of burns the seeds of our positive karma and so that they won't ripen properly or ripen at all sometimes. And then also it creates humongous amounts of negative karma. And also, you know, the very essence of Dharma practice is compassion for others and it's malice. It's the exact opposite of that. Right? It's wanting to, if compassion is the wish to free others from suffering, malice is the wish to cause suffering. So even though all the mental afflictions are things to be overcome, I think it's fair to say that uh, since Shanti Deva says there's no evil greater than anger, that, that anger will be the first. You know, so like if, you, you know, um, the anger is because it's so destructive. So they would say, yeah, uh, work on overcoming anger first. And the other thing they say is anger is also easier, actually. The good news is there's one piece of <laughs> anger is bad news in a way, but there's one piece of good news, which is um, they often say this, that anger is actually easier to overcome and decrease than desire is, for example, or craving, you know, or attachment is because um if you reflect at all, I mean, people can like being angry, but it's pretty easy to see that anger causes you to be suffering. You know, like if we're, while we're still selfish, it's easy to see that anger causes us suffering. You can't sleep, as you're saying, right? You can't sleep at night. Your mind's agitated. You're unhappy. Actually, if you check your own experience, you see you're you're not happy, and that's easy to see if you actually start to look for it. So it's also easier to kind of recognize that anger is a is an afflicted state, whereas Attachment is also an afflicted state, but it's harder to see that because when we're attached and we get what we want, it's temporarily, briefly uh, appears to us pleasurable. Um, according to Buddhism, <laughs> they say brief, I'm phrasing it in a Buddhist way, right? Briefly and appears. Um, so 
for that reason also, um, the good news is that anger is a little easier in the sense that you can actually see pretty easily. Wow, this is making me unhappy. So John, to go back to your question. So yeah, the, the idea would be that we need to overcome all the mental afflictions, but in a way, anger is the, the most what's the word, urgent. Like it's like an emergency or something. You know, it's like a, yeah, it'd be like, uh, you could say that, that anger is like uh, almost like an, an emergency or a crisis situation to overcome. Well, Whereas the others you need to overcome gradually. It, it also seems, I mean, when I at least look at the six words, it's the easiest to say, yes, I can take this one on. Where attachment, if you're talking about your child, uh, you know, being attached to your daughter or your son, is at least for many of us, is a much harder thing to say, oh, I'm going to overcome that and not be attached to my child. Yeah. No, I agree. So it's an easier one. Yeah, so it's easier to see. And yeah, so so I think you're right uh, that it's, um, I think you're getting at the right point, which is that, uh, yeah, if, if, if we're going to work on overcoming our mental afflictions, good to start with. It's good to start with anger and focus on anger. And if anger arises, it's good to directly, you know, and then, um, and also I think it gives us a little confidence. I've seen that happen for real, many real people where you can go, wow, I've gotten better with anger. Maybe not. Yeah, I've seen a lot of real people I know who practice who say, well, my anger is better. So maybe then I can work on jealousy or attachment or ignorance and they can decrease too because anger did. So there's hope. Uh, so I think that's a good way to think of it is that, you know, we can see we can decrease our anger and that's practical uh many many people do that you know and it's not it's not easy but it's not that hard to at least decrease it it's hard to have a cessation of anger of course that's a different thing but but to decrease it is not so difficult so it's a good thing to start with yeah then yeah it can give hope because attachment is harder as you said um to, to eliminate uh because and also like in the text said right because attachment was a metaphor he used it's like um it soaks in, right? Like a piece of cloth with oil or something. That's a so Kappa says that. Right? He says, uh, with attachment, it's like oil sucked into a piece of cloth that's really hard to clean. Uh anger is not quite like that because it's a little easier to get rid of. Any other comments? Well, maybe I'll say, uh, since only a couple minutes left, I'll say, um, well, I'll stop there. I won't get it. We're, I thought we'd get to pride, but we'll just cover pride next time. Um, uh, but I was going to say a couple things. One is, uh, I was just quoting Sonkapa, so I thought to say this. Uh, is Tomorrow is Lama Sonkapa Day, is one point, just to mention it to people. Uh, it's the anniversary of his uh, passing. And so it's the day on which uh, one kind of celebrates Sonkapa's life and activities. So um anyway if you have some free time tomorrow i, I always encourage people like best actually the dalai lama said something which i thought was very profound which is you know there were a lot of like you know so there were like guru, guru yoga practices of sonkapa which are very good to do and so on there are all kinds of practices really sonkapa and then the dalai lama said but you know it's good to do those but the best thing is to read sonkapa's writings you know like uh because then you get to know actually what he said you know and, and feel like you understand his mind actually and what is he taught so um so if you have free time tomorrow, a few minutes even, or something, I would encourage you, like, you know, there are lots of, I mean, oh my goodness, uh, now there are many books translated of Sankapa, but also online, there are a lot of, you know, Tupton Jimpa has translated many of his texts, and Bob Thurman has translated some, and Jeffrey Hopkins, and many, many people. So, um, Gareth Sparham. So anyway, there are many wonderful translations. So if you have a chance tomorrow, read a few lines even, or something, or a few pages of something by Sankapa, or, or do a guru yoga. To Sankapa, but especially to read his words. That's what the Dalai Lama said. He said, um, once I was there, and the Dalai Lama said, um, you know, there's a practice of Nundro, you know, like the preliminary practices, and sometimes in the Glug Patrician, Guru Yoga is one of them, and in the Glug Patrician tend to do like a hundred thousand recitations of Sankapa's uh praise to Sankapa, the Migmetse, the Migtsema, Migmetse Wet Tirti Chenrezi, Jume Kim Bewambo Jambayang, Dungumba, anyway, that one. Um and the Dalai Lama said, that's very good, but it's better. He said, uh, he said, it's good if you do that, but he said, it's better to read this. So Kappa's five works on emptiness. He said, that's a better, if you, he said that, he said, if you, if you want to develop a connection to Son Kappa, you know, if you, he said, it's fine, of course, do the preliminary practice, but it's better if you read the five works of him that he wrote on emptiness, uh, his five main texts on emptiness. So um, I thought it was a very profound point. So anyway, I'm not saying to read all five of those tomorrow. Obviously, it's impossible, but uh, they're quite long. Some, 
but anyway, uh, tomorrow is a good day to sort of do something in relation to Tsongkhapa because it's the anniversary of him. And usually in, in the monastery, they light a lot of candles or lights uh, in honor of Tsongkhapa. And then also, uh, just briefly uh, say this is the last class, I guess, of this year. And so I, I haven't sent it out, but I'll send it. I'll send uh, Gabe and others the. Uh, I'll, send, I'll send out the uh, a schedule at least for January, maybe February too soon. I'll probably at least I'll send January first and then February because I'm waiting to hear back from somebody about something for February, but. Anyway, I'll at least send the January dates right away so that people know what they are. And then soon after that, I'll send the February dates. So that, and this text, I, I mean, I will continue with this at least, I don't know, I was looking at it and trying to figure it out. It'll, it'll go at least through March. So I'm not sure if we'll, we'll finish it in either March or April, probably. So um, no hurry. But okay. Anyway, uh, but thanks everybody. And I hope you have a good uh, new year. And then, oh, we should do the verse of, uh, so def, uh, dedication. Uh, Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta, where it has not arisen, may it arise and grow, or it has arisen, may it not decrease, but increase more and more. In the snowy mountain paradise, you, the source of good and happiness, all powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. I dedicate all these merits, which are merely labeled, totally empty from their own side, so that the I, who is merely labeled, totally empty from its own side, may achieve Buddha's enlightenment, which is merely labeled, totally empty from its own side. Uh, in order to lead all sentient beings who are merely labeled totally empty from their own side to the state of enlightenment as quickly as possible. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much. You, Lauren. No, thanks. Thanks. Good holiday. Thank you, Lauren. Happy holidays, that everyone. That was wonderful. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, yeah.